Hello, everybody. So let me begin. Esotericism exists in texts and in practices. Most esoteric texts and practices are communicated through translations. So the connection between esotericism and translation goes back to antiquity. But has the relation between the two also been an object of critical reflection? Rarely. And if so, in which way? Here is what I would like to present to you within the next hour. First, opening the fields, translation, translation studies, and the study of esotericism, the agents and process of translation, the frames and functions of tra translation, boundary building and untranslatability, asymmetries, policy, and politics of translation, and my conclusion. So, opening the fields, translation studies and the study of esotericism. What do translation studies and the study of esotericism have in common? They are both academic interdisciplines of fairly recent origin. They emerged only within the past three, four decades, growing out of a variety of long-established disciplines, linguistics, philology, history of religion, philosophy, which means both had and still have to define their own theoretical and methodological foundation and struggle to be acknowledged and equally respected by the scientific community in the humanities. But there's more that both have in common. Translation is a process and a form of communication to make something incomprehensible comprehensible. Second, it requires expert knowledge and is thus related to discourse about authority. Both have an aura of authority. For scholars of translation studies, it has to do with claims of linguistic dominance, cultural superiority, geopolitics, ideology. Esotericism and the study of it has to do with claims of authenticity, truth, and chosenness. The process, material, and results of both are contested. They are subjects to what Heftziba Israel has recently called a hermeneutics of suspicion. Just think of the well-known idiom traditore traditore. The translator is a traitor. The academic study of esotericism can be traced back to the 1970s, early 80s, from the so-called religionist approach in religious studies, Antoine Fevre, the journal Ariès to Western esotericism, as we, since 2007, to the current turn of global perspectives, KC. It is now about to become an interdiscipline, religious studies, anthropology, cultural studies, philology, psychology, and philosophy. Let us now take a look at translation studies, at a glimpse. As you can see here from this picture, translation studies can be dis um, sort of distinguished applied, translate all the part of applied and pure translation studies, theoretical, descriptive. As a new discipline, it has developed from applied linguistics and philology only since the 1980s, a process which began, by the way, in Germany, when for the first time the narrow idea of translating words and sentences as part of applied linguistics broadened to a whole text and its context. After this cultural turn, translation studies then, since the 1990s, also began to highlight the social function of translation and its entanglement with networks of power, ideology, and value judgments such that translation always entails negotiation with a number of factors, both material and symbolic. Methodologically, linguistic schools in the former GDR played a role. A major impact also came from scholars in Israel who drew inspiration from the school of Russian formalism and the structuralist tradition. Unfortunately, Many of the manifested scholarly achievements of this new discipline have still not been really noticed outside of its own limits. Here's a definition of the term translation from the Russian philosopher translation scholar Natalia Aftanomova. 
In a narrow sense, translation, we call it translation proper, means the transfer of words, phrases, texts from one language to, into another. In a wider metaphorical sense, translation means the dynamics of transitions, of transfers between different levels of human experience, different semiotic systems. Translation from one language into another can be seen as a supporting analogy for the understanding of other procedures in the field of cognition and culture. The word translation is a compositum. English, translate, from Latin, translare, translatus, carried over, means both translate and interpret. Interpret is ambiguous also, it means oral, simultaneous translation and explain. As a general assumption, the idea of interpreting is usually not really associated with the term translating. In the Roman languages, it has different roots, Latin roots, French traduction, Spanish traduction, um, Portuguese and all these from this root, from traducere, active verb, verb, to lead something across, German übersetzen, Russian perevod, from this active verb. Why are the roots of the term so different? Have you ever asked yourself? The idea of translating from one language to another as an equivalent to the original is a relatively new one in Europe. It is inseparably connected to the history of Christianity and the Western history of scientific cognition, the relationship between truth, faith, and reason. To quote Clement from Alexandria, Greek philosophy is the handmaiden of theology. The Judeo-Christian emphasis on scripture, and more so on one single authoritative written text at the center of any religion, became the norm and a universal category. Historically, the idea of translation is closely connected to the topos of translatio imperii. That's how the word came. Translate the empire which was equal to the transfer of a whole cultural formation from the Greco-Roman antiquity to the Latin Middle Ages. Then, with the Renaissance, came the idea of retranslating the Greek texts into Latin, into various national languages. A theoretical shift occurred from a vertical idea of translation in antiquity to the Middle Ages. We could say the translation of the one language of God to a horizontal one in Renaissance and in the modern age. So the birth of the idea of equivalence to the one and only original text, and with it equivalence between different languages, between source and target text, is inseparably again connected to the Bible. And with its transfer to the aesthetic dimension of translation, literature, new ideas of quality and perfection of translation came, the term itself was established in the Roman languages. It appeared only in 1400, around 1400, the term traductio appeared as an action connected with responsibility, which replaced the older form of translatio, translatio imperi. This lexicological change reflects the triumphant shift from a vertical to a horizontal notion of translation in the modern era. Some scholars in recent research have pointed out that philological translation has always been connected with mysticism. A survey of literary translation by Chantal Wright from 2016, for example, describes it as a spiritual endeavor, a meditative practice, with a spiritual dimension, even a metaphysical enterprise that gives us an insight into the nature of language and thought. And she's talking about literary translation. How do we generally understand translation? Translation transfers information and or meaning from one language to another, from a source text to a target text, a fixed meaning like a transport in a container. This can be oral or written. Language is understood as national language. Target texts remain unnoticed as translations. Translators are either mediators, oh, they are visible. They are either, um, uh, translations are done by individual persons, 
And translators are either mediators, helpers, and divinators or traitors and manipulators. And equivalence is the norm. All these assumptions will have to be deconstructed now. So by offering some insights from recent translation studies, I hope to help to cross-pollinate with what Mika Baal has called traveling concepts, which can be productively applied to the study of esotericism. Let us now look at the agents and process of translation. Here we see the invisible translator, the invisible interpreter uh, in the middle of the picture. Translation is a social act. Who are the agents of translation? And which strategies do they have to act, especially in the context of esotericism, when it comes to sacred texts? What does the process of translation involve? Translation brings the process of meaning making to, of sacred texts to the fore, since it can handle the sacred texts in different ways. For instance, reify or displace the status of a sacred text. Can the translation be considered as sacred as the original? Here's my first example. The first religious, it comes from Michael Lackner. The first religious and often also secular texts were translated into non-European languages, China, Korea, India, by individuals, Christian missionaries, missionaries, Jesuits, Europeans from a different religion. Ludovico Bullio's translation of Thomas Aquinas' Summa Theologica into Chinese, 17th century. Thomas Aquinas was one of the core figures in the history of Christian theology, as well as the monotheistic deification of reason in Western science. In this case, there was a clear source text, not only terms, but whole concepts did not exist in the target language or they were associated with different philosophical or historical Chinese concepts. For instance, the term philosophy was immediately associated with the 11th century Chinese neo-Confucianism. For the Western translator, there were, and according to current translation studies, there still are two basic strategies. We call them, we can call them foreignizing or domesticating. I don't explain, I think you understand what I mean. In Chinese, however, there is a third way of rendering a new concept besides domesticating or foreignizing, namely the combination of two or sometimes more characters, morphemes, which have not been combined in tradition. So Ludovico Bullio, the Jesuit missionary, tried to create a Christian Chinese language, but for the sake of conversion, his ultimate goal, of, of course, he chose this third way. So with this hybrid translation, the willingness to cultural compromise became a characteristic feature. As Lakna mentions, this was also used for the Chinese translation of the Quran. My second example is 200 years later, in the 1980s and 90s, the Russian philosopher Natalia Aftanomova translated Sigmund Freud and the French philosopher Jacques Derrida into Russian. But the Russian language neither provided adequate terms nor linguistic expressions of Derrida's way of thinking. She had to introduce new terms into the Russian language and more. While translating Derrida's text, Naissance d'un psychoanalyste de Mesmer à Freud, she writes, my task was to introduce a new non-substantial ontology into the Russian language. That is, the object of translation, the original, is itself already translated, a multi-level construct. In this process of translation, the target language itself was changed. Now, for scholars of religion and philologists, like in these two examples, Written sacred texts have been the primary locus, as I mentioned. Anthropologists, maybe the majority in this room, often face much more complex material when challenged to translate. Outside of a written text, any oral narrative, object, artwork, image, ritual, action, or sound perceived as sacred or holy or used 
for any purpose can be considered sacred by a community. Roman Jakobson has offered a helpful extension to classify translations in his article from 1959. Not only interlingual texts, the most common type, translation proper, but also intralingual and intersemiotic translations. Also written and oral types of translation. Here are some more examples for the multi-level metaphorical use of translation, which anthropologists face. Anthropologist Lina Aschenbrenner recently demonstrated the translation process from the Hawaiian hula practice to a practice in South German New Age communities. In this translation process, the authority of the teacher shifted from a genealogically transmitted communal status of the indigenous to that of a foreign exotic practice. Giovanna Capone also recently demonstrated ongoing ritual changes and transformations in the Afro-Brazilian religions, which are becoming more practical, minimalistic and portable, thus appealing for a global transnational urban audience. She considered the impact of technologies on the transmission of both form and content of knowledge considered sacred. Human, mechanical, or digital forms of reiterations for either elite or mass communication. We learned that rituals even become transported into the digital realm. This process of translation Capone called frictionless. It seems to offer a new, different approach to spirituality in which knowledge transmission no longer relies solely on secrecy and orality, but also on priests and priestesses with adequate skills to transmit spiritual energy and presence within digital space. Sometimes, the notion of language needs to be expanded, and translation can only be grasped as an intersemiotic process. Here are two examples, again, from anthropologists. Liora Sarfati recently demonstrated a case of multi-level translation. A highly revered Korean shaman initiated a German woman from Bavaria, who then began to practice in Germany however, regularly visiting her spiritual teacher in Korea. As long as she lived, no interpreter was needed. This is the case of non-translation. Because as the German practitioner disciple emphasized, minds connect without language. But recently, after the shaman's death, other shamans in Korea who had tolerated the German woman as long as she was protected by the main shaman's authority, expressed alienation and distrust emerged on both sides. So the German woman now suddenly felt excluded from the target language and culture and is seeking professional interpreters. Traditore, traditore. Finally, Juan Rivera demonstrated how he translates a ritual in a remote indigenous tribe in the Andes. A situation with dance, musical sounds from instruments and oral sounds of the human voice deliberately devoid of meaning in any human language. Here is another process of multi-level translation, intersemiotic, from sound and gestures to textual meaning, and then into a written text for publication to the scientific community. Transmitted back to the source, if not, is this strategy a strategy of isolation? Clifford Gertz wrote that ethnographic accounts inevitably carry signatures of their authors, because ultimately the anthropologist is translating non-academic accounts and often foreign narratives into academic and Western idioms. I have mentioned the problem of the language of religion the perception and function of a variety of texts and terms as sacred is one of the challenges for translators. Often there is either no word in the target language or the object or phenomenon itself doesn't exist. Let us look at a few examples for problem in translating religious esoteric terms. 
there is an ongoing discourse about how to translate the term spirituality as in new spiritual movements into Russian. There's the term duchovnost from the word duch, which means spirit, but also spirit, which means alcohol, and is too closely connected to the Russian Christian Orthodox Church. So we cannot use this term. In German, there is a distinction between geistig and geistlich. And it's possible to mark the philosophical or uh, uh, and the Christian religious difference in meaning. But the foreign word spirituell is easier to adopt to the German language than to the Russian. In Iran, both spirituality and esotericism are equivalent, as I learned. They're translated as unknown language. Solutions in translation differ according to the truth claim of the translator, scholars, missionaries, literal translation, metaphorical or symbolic. Sometimes they can also differ according to disciplinary perspectives. For a Russian icon painter, the material and process of the act of icon painting, canvas, color, paint, brush, are all part of a sacred act of opening a channel, a direct window to God, to the divine. The Orthodox believer sees in this a sacred act of translation of the soul to heaven and the way back, while the religious studies scholar may analyze the ingredients of faith and the art historian highlights the central perspective as a core aesthetic value of icon painting. Translation here becomes what the Dutch scholar Mieke Baal has called a traveling concept, an act without words. She also calls it a failing speech act, moving towards a transfiguration or the fixation of a mental image. So I conclude this point. Looking at agents of esoteric translation, biographical background of the translator, their interests, intentions, and the conception of language, and also of the sacred are essential for his or her personal interpretation. The process of translation always depends on the norms and strategic strategies chosen by the translator, which in turn depend on their cultural background, as well as the time, the zeitgeist, and the ruling epistemology. For instance, foreignizing translations dominated in the era of Romanticism, while domesticating translations are dominating in eras of realism, also in authoritarian societies, and in Russia, Soviet Russia, and China probably, so ideological context. They prefer the domesticating. The frames and functions of translation, not all are equally long. This is the longest part. In the example of the icon painter, the significance of frames and functions of a translation became already obvious. When it comes to translating religious or esoteric texts or practices, much depends on its ontological status. For the Western history, Christian tradition has set the long-term norms for translation studies, which has led to equally long-lasting doctrinal biases. And we can see that they still dominate today, generally. Christianity is the religion of translation par excellence, I quote Michael Lackner. Are sacred texts a special case for translation? Some scholars have claimed this, others reject the idea. Since most religions come from oral tradition, the transfer from oral to written can be considered cons historically the first form of translation. The perception and function of a variety of texts as sacred have shaped religions. Has, have been shared by religions or translated in ways that have thrust whole religions either into prominence or into oblivion. Here is another example in China. Buddhist esoteric texts were translated into Chinese for about 1,000 years, from the 2nd to the 12th centuries. Tian Ran Wang, a um, scholar, a Chinese scholar from Munich, has investigated these types of translations. I think she's one of the first who does that. Multiple translatorship was the norm, which, excluded, which included oral presentation and interpreter, a scribe, one or several publishers, 
a critic and a reader. Often agents in this process of translation did not even know the source language. That was Sanskrit. What we call relay translation into an intermediary language was also involved. And the translation process was performed in real time in front of a crowd in public. So I quote her, there is no static source or target text. Text is not a still object, rather a textual event. The texts are multidimensional, multifunctional, multi-perspectivist. And this aspect, collaborative translation, with no individual translator, has no clear source text, requires, and no clear source text requires a methodological approach combining agents, translators, and the process. It has not been much investigated at all, and only very recently addressed by some scholars of translation studies. But it sheds particular light on differences in Western, European, and Eastern Asian traditions of translation, especially of religious sacred texts. Now, one that you will be very familiar with, um, one of the main functions, we're here, functions, one of the main functions of translation in history has been nation building, identity. My example, the Indian historian Chitraleha Suchi has analyzed the translations of the 12th century Indian classical Sanskrit text, Raja Taranjini. Do I pronounce this right? River of Kings into English. On the one hand, several 19th century European Orientalists. On the other, from an Indian nationalist. Translations made this text iconic for both nationalist writers and post-colonial writers. Suchi's analysis shows how translations traveled both ways, from west to east and back. She thereby reveals the interconnectedness of the 19th century colonial European Orientalist and the Indian nationalist discourses. Both, I quote, both were driven by German romantic conceptions about literature as a repository of national essences. She also showed that the source text as one coherent text itself is a construction. The comparison of the authority, influence, and resonance of both European Orientalist and Hindu nationalist translations also demonstrates the hierarchy between the languages, which points to another point, um, which I will address later, the asymmetry of power. To conclude this point, translation studies and the study of esotericism from a global perspective should pay close attention to the colonial framing of traveling texts and concepts, both ways. Boundary building. We generally tend to understand translation as an act of bridging languages and cultures by conveying equivalence and exchange. But nation building historically has been primarily a Western project. While the role of translation in creating identity without colonial encounters has been a very different one. We have to consider that translation happens in the world, which for centuries has been distributed by colonial powers and ruled by binary categories, center, periphery, north, south, or as the Japanese US translation scholar Naoki Sakai has put it, right? <laughs> Not yet, uh, the West and the rest. The idea of a unified national language implies a naturalized origin of an ethnic community, which, according to Sakai, has been imposed by the West to the rest of the world. Due to the colonial geopolitical history, translation cannot be represented within the scheme of nationality and internationality, he claims. And here I quote, Translation is an act of articulation that takes place in the social topos of difference or incommensurability. When we use the term untranslatability in relation to religion and esotericism, we may immediately think about certain ancient languages which have been considered to be sacred languages of divine revelation as 
linguistic miracles, these languages supposedly cannot be grasped by human minds and have therefore been considered to be untranslatable. Hebrew, remember the legend of the Septuaginta, the, I, I recall it here, uh, when uh, 72 uh, monks, uh, six of each of the 12 tribes of Israel, were sitting down to translate from Hebrew the Bible to uh, Greek. And the legend goes that they all produced the same translation. So they were separate, but they produced exactly the same, the language of God. There is only one. Second language is Sanskrit. Yves Mühlematter has recently shown, analyzed the translation of the Bhagavad Gita to the context of theosophy, which was possible only via clairvoyance, for instance. So not just this translation only, the sacred language. And a third, Arabic, the Quran, to this day is not considered to be, uh, you know, it's, it, I, I don't say it's not permitted, but there is a high commission that uh, guards translations uh, from Quran into other languages, as recently demonstrated by Senegalesian philologist Suleiman Dianya, who reported that a Saudi Arabian commission intervened when a Senegalesian poet wanted to translate parts of the Quran into his own African language, Wolof, but it was considered to be heathen, and the commission said he shouldn't do that. The term untranslatability has not only used in this context, but it has also been used for a long time um, for a long time as an unproductive slogan for various limitations, mostly instrumental for ideological reasons. We hear at the nation uh, uh, at the point of national identity. Linguistic policies, reasons for untranslatabilities are omnipresent and by far not only apply to distant languages and cultures. This, this is a traditional essentialist discourse, but I mention it because it is still valid. And it, for instance, is still the dominating linguistic discourse in Russia till today. The Polish-Australian linguist Anna Wierzbicka can be found in academia saying that there are certain um, certain constants of a culture that cannot be translated, certain terms, certain phenomena. They're unique because they're to one, they belong only to one nation. Now, over the past decade, there has been, I, I dismiss this uh, by translation studies that overcome this position mostly. But over the past decade, there has been a new interesting discourse in the humanities on the term untranslatability, now used in a different way. For the French philosopher Barbara Cassin, one of the main proponents of this discourse, her field is the translation of philosophical terms. Untranslatability is a metaphor for the difficult, challenging case of translation, which requires a process of constant reconstruction, manufacturing meaning and adapting to the historically and culturally specific situation to old and new audiences. And here again, the question arises, pointing at more analogies between translation and esotericism. Isn't esoteric knowledge untranslatable for the uninitiated? And for someone who does not know the source language of a translated text, isn't the original text something equally esoteric? For a person who does not know the source language, oh, I said that, hmm, asymmetries. Policy and politics of translation. It has already become clear, hopefully, that the power relations among languages and cultures are essential when we assess and interpret translation flows, especially global scale. There's a dynamic and ever changing relationship between labor and power. To quote once more Naoki Sakai, power relationships among languages and cultures are essential when assessing and interpreting translation flows. Translation is a form of political work which aims at creating continuity at a point of social discontinuity. And here's a simple fact. 60% of all translations worldwide are done from English. 10% are done in French and German, 
4% in Spanish, Italian, Russian, and Swedish, and all others, among them Chinese and Arabic, are less than 1%. Nowadays, translation flows depend on markets, commissioning target cultures. Translation can be used by one culture to dominate another. And all acts of translation are simultaneously also acts of interpretation and manipulation, as uh, Antoine Lefebvre has put it. And uh, maybe my last example before I conclude. In Estonia, the prestigious University of Tartu used to produce more than 90% of its publications as translations in and from Russian until 1990 when it ceased to be a republic of the Soviet empire and became an independent state. In 2021, 97% of its texts and publications are from English, while only 3% are from Russian. I can't help to mention my last example for the asymmetries of power in the study of esotericism, an international conference on the study of esotericism in St. Petersburg. The international scholars attend the all English panels with presentations by their own colleagues. They enjoy the guided tour through the beautiful old city, but no one shows an interest in any of the conference panels by Russians held in Russian. In spite of the fact that the organizers provided professional interpreters for all panels to bridge the language gap. In the end, the Russian organizers of the conference remained with debts for the interpreters whom they had paid from their own pocket and no international publication followed because almost none of the foreign Western scholars submitted articles for the conference proceedings published in Russia. Let me conclude. Translation is an anthropological constant, but it is basically invisible. A social practice, not only a reproductive, but in itself a creative act. Nothing is untranslatable. We can debate this, but this does not mean to assume a universal dialogue. To quote once more the Russian philosopher Natalia Aktanomova, critical reflection about translation helps to disclose one of the most powerful myths of our present time, the myth of a universal dialogue between humans and cultures. Translating is the condition of a possible dialogue, not the other way around. The idea of a fixed original is a construction, just as there does not have to be one individual translator, but collaborative translation has been a long-term practice outside of the West. Translation is not one, but a multidimensional. That is, translation impacts both the original and the target text, impacts and possibly changes text and language. It transforms rather than replaces languages. And translation always includes asymmetries, both in terms and policies, uh, in, in terms of policy and politics. And finally, translation is a paradox. It both builds bridges, fills gaps, and creates boundaries. Now, most standard religious studies anthologies do not include translation either as a critical term or concept that has had a part to play in the construction of religion or the academic study of religions. However, to rephrase a statement by religious studies scholar Engler, scholars of esotericism should therefore be doubly attentive to translation because ignoring the complexities of translation leads to disregarding the history and politics that lies behind the construction of the category religion. The Routledge Handbook of Translation and Religion, published only a few months ago in, in 2023, is a significant step to a new subfield of research, namely the relation between translation and religion, and I add esotericism. Very few scholars have treated translation and esotericism as intersecting ontological categories. This is my thesis. Mutually influencing or challenging each other, while both potentially constitute texts, languages, and peoples. It applies to all fields of human activity. Therefore, it is equally 
a means of cognition and the condition of the possibility to reflect objects in the humanities. By this critical self-reflection, we will be able to sketch anew the contours of the cognitive and epistemological complexity of the problem of human communication. And here's the recent publications that give me hope that this connection between translation, philosophy, esotericism, religion, is, has been discovered only very recently. You can see that all these publications, Routledge books, uh, Routledge Handbook of Translation and Philosophy. I'm sorry, you cannot read it really, but uh, uh, Routledge Handbook, uh, Translation and Philosophy, Translation and Religion, Untranslatability, and Religion, Philosophy, and uh, just a, a now new Routledge Handbook of Translation Studies, third edition. And this is the first uh, anthology of the question of translation in anthropology. I came out in 2003. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you.